Hello everyone, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the registrars uh, who have taken time to prepare this talk on the shoulder examination uh, for the fifth year. Understanding of the anatomy is crucial when trying to make a diagnosis from your clinical examination of the shoulder. This picture shows the bony and ligamentous anatomy of the shoulder, which includes the humeral head, the coracoid, the clavicle, the glenoid and scapula, the long head of biceps, which goes underneath the transverse ligament between the lesser tuberosity and the greater tuberosity, the acromioclavicular ligaments, which consist of the trapezoid and the coronoid, the AC joint, the coracoacromial ligament, and the glenohumeral ligaments, which consist of the superior, middle, and inferior anterior glenohumeral ligaments, as well as the inferior capsule. This lateral view of the shoulder uh, reveals a rotator cuff, which consists of the supraspinatus tendon, the subscapularis, which inserts onto the lesser tuberosity, the infraspinatus, and the teres minor, which also insert onto the greater tuberosity with the supraspinatus. This is the acromion and the coracoacromial uh, ligament where the subacromial impingement occurs on the rotator cuff. Long head of biceps goes between the lesser tuberosity and the greater tuberosity uh, underneath the transverse ligament of the biceps. You also need to know this large number of muscles which move the scapula and the humerus. As with all patients, uh, the history is vital and should give the diagnosis in approximately 90% of cases. The examination is really there to confirm uh, what you suspect uh, is the problem, and this consists of a careful general examination followed by screening of the joint above and below the shoulder, a careful inspection and palpation, as well as active and passive range of motion, before moving on to special tests and then investigations. The history needs to determine when, how, and what precipitated the symptoms. Was it spontaneous on onset or related to trauma? And what has happened to, the, to those symptoms since the initial event? You also need to understand many questions related to the pain, such as where it is arising from and where does it radiate to. It must also ask uh, about the joint. Is there any clicking or catching occurring? Is there a feeling of instability? Or is there stiffness with loss of range of motion? Other symptoms such as weakness or sensation changes may suggest that the origin is from the cervical spine or brachial plexus rather than from the shoulder itself. The history should also assess the level of activity and loss of function, especially relating to activities of daily living, because this will help us decide when to intervene or what operation is necessary. The past medical history is very important because many conditions are associated with shoulder diseases such as diabetes and thyroid disease are intrinsically related to frozen shoulder and cultivic tendonitis amongst other things. The past surgical history is also important as there may have been a previous dislocation surgery or trauma which may result in secondary osteoarthritis. A careful family history may reveal uh, things such as hemochromatosis or history of rheumatoid arthritis. And both rotator cuff and, uh, tears and instability of the shoulder have a genetic predisposition. Medications are also important because they may affect tendon integrity such as steroids or quinolones. The inspection of the shoulder can be done with either the patient sitting or standing but you need to fully undress and expose the shoulder, the neck, and the chest. You must always screen the cervical spine and the elbow prior to doing the shoulder examination. These are orthopedic terms that describe the position of the shoulder. Inspection of the skin should look for any signs of inflammation, which may be acute or chronic, as well as previous surgical scars, and any evidence of trauma, such as bruising. You should look for normal muscle contours. If there is an abnormality, it may be arising from the joint 
or from bony changes underneath there and may not be an intrinsic muscle problem. But if there is wasting of the muscles, it may be related to a neurological problem, a torn rotator cuff tear or chronic disuse, and you must always compare to the other side. In the top right photograph, if you inspect from the top, you can clearly see in the wasting of the infraspinatus and supraspinatus, which is seen in a chronic rotator cuff tear. And this young guy in the bottom photograph, you can see a normal scapular musculature and here's wasting of the supraspinatus and possibly trapezius as well as infraspinatus and here's a neurological problem rather than a tendon problem. Inspection should also assess the bony landmarks such as the clavicle and the cranium as this may give you a clue to the underlying pathology as seen in this photograph in the bottom where we can see squaring off of the shoulder which may be associated with the dislocation. Uh, we can see the anterior aspect of the shoulder is swollen to suggest the humeral head is sitting anteriorly inferiorly, but this may also just be wasting of the deltoid. Palpation is used to confirm the findings from the inspection and to elicit further signs. You need to feel for uh, inflammation, swelling, deformity, or even wasting. And please don't forget to check for sensation and pulses in the patient. Palpation needs to evaluate all parts of the anatomy, uh, including bone, joint, and muscle, as shown here in the slide. The palpation should confirm any muscle wasting. You need to evaluate any surgical scars that are found and determine the origin of the masses or swelling that have been encountered. Do not forget to examine the villa. Next, we move on to active range of motion, as shown in the video on the on the right, we can demonstrate to the patient the range of motion that we want to be tested. This is forward elevation. We ask them to externally rotate with the elbows by the side. We then move on to internal rotation where we ask the patient to put the thumbs up along the spine and then we measure the level that the top of the thumb goes to. We move on to abduction external rotation followed by abduction internal rotation and then cross abduction. This video does not show abduction, which needs to be tested as well. While doing the range of motion, you need to look at the patient's face to see if there's any pain uh, produced by the specific movement. You need to document any decrease in movement, which may be due to weakness, pain, or a physical block such as a tight posterior capsule, or uh, osteoarthritis. At the same time, you need to assess is there any crepitus associated with the movement. The slide shows the range of motion in degrees that has been suggested as normal. However, this is not uh, really true. What you need to do is you need to compare to the other side to see if there's a deficit. And you must also note where the pain is occurring, such as in the mid off position, which suggests rotator cuff impingement or a tear, or end range of, range of motion, maybe early arthritis or AC joint. We now move on to special tests where we examine the rotator cuff for impingement and rotator cuff tears followed by instability of the shoulder, AC joint problems, and the biceps tendon. The pathology, diagnosis, and treatment of common shoulder problems will be discussed in other lectures, but rotator cuff impingement, which is a common problem, is related to the supraspinatus tendon which is here, and it rubs against the acromion or the coracoacromal ligament as shown here. This x-ray depicts the small bony spur, which is seen there, and predisposes you to the impingement or possible rotator cuff death, although this is 
disputable. The bursa, which is shown here, may be inflamed, giving rise to the impingement. These three pictures depict the problems with impingement. This is the large bursa, which is seen in the subacromial space and depicted in the picture on the bottom left here. And we can see this x-ray shows the spur of the acromion, which is causing uh, the impingement on the rotator cuff. This is an otoscopic view of the subacromial space. This is the acromion. You can see where it's being rubbed upon. This is the top of the rotator cuff. You can see it's all furry. And as we were taking the femoral head with the rotator cuff on top, we can see how it impinges up against the acromion. This space should normally be completely smooth with no sign of the tendon rubbing on the acromion. There are four tests for impingement, which will be demonstrated in the video shortly. The first is pain in the mid-off position at 70 to 120 degrees, then asking the patient to abduct. The next test is near sign, where you put the arm in into rotation with the thumb pointing to the ground. You abduct the arm in a neutral scapular position, so in line of the scapular plane and that will obtain in 70 to 120 degrees, followed by Hawkins sign, where the arm is brought up in a neutral position to forward flexion of about 90 degrees, and then internal rotation. And then finally, there's Nears test, where a subacromial cortisone and local anesthetic injection is given, and the pain will disappear on repeating the test. This is the first test with the pain in the mid off position of doing abduction in line of the scapula. The next test is interrotation of the arm, hold the scapula down and bring the arm up to about 90 to 120 degrees and the patient will have pain. You can look at the patient's face to check that they really do have pain. The next, the arm is in neutral position, elbow flexed, flex it up to 90 degrees and internally rotate the arm. If these are positive, you can then go on to the nearest test with the local anesthetic. This is a video of the subacromial space when we are viewing from the lateral aspect of the shoulder. This is the supraspinatus tendon. This is a remnant of supraspinatus and subscapularis over here. There's the biceps. This is the cartilage of the humeral head. The glenoid is sitting over here. And this is the greater tuberosity where the tendon should be sitting. So as we get it moving, we can see this is a piece of tendon that is torn off the greater tuberosity. And this will make them weak in abduction for the supraspinatus abductor and external rotation because this is interspinatus, which is an external rotator, while the subscapularis is intact, so internal rotation shouldn't be affected except due to pain. Um, 
on moving the arm. There are several individual tests for each rotator cuff tendon. The first is the Job's test for supraspinatus, where as you can see in this picture, the arm is in 90 degrees of abduction, internal rotation with the thumbs pointing down, and 30 degrees of forward flexion. You then ask the patient to resist you while you try and push the arms down, as shown in this video. You ask them to resist against you while you're trying to put them down. If it's painful or weak, it may suggest a rotator cuff tear or subacromial impingement and bursitis. The next test is for infraspinatus. You ask the patient to keep their elbows by their side with the elbow flexed up to 90 degrees and then ask them to externally rotate against resistance as shown in this video. You may also check it individually by pushing against the arm and palpating the muscle to see if it is uh, contracting. If there's any pain and weakness, this may suggest it there. The next test is for infraspinatus and teres minor together. The arm is put into abduction 90 degrees with 90 degrees of elbow flexion and ask them to externally rotate again against resistance. If there's weak external rotation, uh, this confirms a significant tear of infraspinatus and involving teres minor. And if it falls down against gravity, this is called the drop arm sign. Or if you put the arm back down by the side, and they lose uh, the ability to keep it in external rotation. This is called the lag sign. This, demonstrate, this video demonstrates the drop arm sign when there's no abduction and external rotation. And when it falls back in after putting it down by the side, that is the lag sign. The other test for a large infraspinatus and teres minor tear is the hornblower sign. And this is when the patient is asked to put their hand to their mouth. The only way they can do this is by abducting the arm to reach the mouth, as shown in this video here. And the left arm, as you can see, he abducts to get his arm to his mouth as he can't externally rotate. When testing for instability, you must do a general examination to look for signs of generalized laxity as described by Byton and will be given in one of the other talks. The other tests are the anterior and posterior draw tests where you put a thumb on the scapular spine and index on the coracoid and stabilize the scapula and you try and move the humeral head either anterior or posterior as shown in the video on the right. Stabilize the scapula and then try and displace the, the humeral head anterior or posterior. The other sign is the sulcus sign when the arm is pulled down in a relaxed patient, and you can see the sulcus sign that appears beneath the acromion as the humeral head subluxes inferiorly. The apprehension test is to test for anterior or anterior inferior instability 
You must warn the patient that they must not let you dislocate their shoulder and you must watch their uh, face to see uh, if they are uh, getting any pain or discomfort. The arm is held at 90 degrees of, of abduction and then externally rotated gently until the patient feels as if the shoulder is going to dislocate. This video highlights what I've just said. Watch the patient's face, stabilize the scapula, abduct the arm to 90 degrees and gently externally rotate until they feel the shoulder is going to for the acromioclavicular joint include the tenderness over the AC joint on palpation, pain at end of range of motion, and then the specific tests are forced deduction across the chest, as shown in this video here. You ask the patient to go into adduction, then you push it further across, and this will reproduce the pain, and then you resist them as they're trying to push the arm back into neutral. The push and pull test is where they push pull against the uh, two hands and this will also reproduce the pain in the shoulder. There are several biceps tendon tests but the most commonly used are the speeds test and the Jurgensen's test. A clinical examination will reveal tenderness over the biceps groove in some of the patients. The speed test is when you do resisted shoulder flexion with a supinated extended elbow as shown in the video here and then this will be followed by the Jorgensen test. So the speed test is palms up and they resisted forward flexion by yourself. Then you place the arms in external rotation 30 degrees, ask them to flex and supinate the arm against resistance while you are palpating the biceps as shown in the video here. Reproduction, reproduction of the pain is considered a positive test. The last examination is for thoracic outlet syndrome. The first three tests are to test for pulse in different positions of the neck, uh, shoulder, and the arm. While the last test, which is called the Ruiz test, is to put the arm in abduction 90 degrees and external rotation of 90 degrees, and then ask them to open and close the fists for three minutes. And then you are checking for neurological symptoms such as fatigue weakness or sensory changes in that arm. These are demonstrated in the student video examination, which is loaded on Vula. So in conclusion, when doing a shoulder examination, you need to undress the patient and go through the basic orthopedic principles of examination, which are look, feel, and move both active and passively, followed by a special test as shown in the previous slides and don't forget to do the joint above and the joint below. There is a full video going through the whole examination with a few extra tests and this is on the UCT ruler site and it's just over eight minutes. Please use it. You will also be shown the examination with most of the clinical pathologies when you come to the clinic and the ward round on your rotation.